Yo, what? Chaos, Shadow, and Metal Sonic? Oh, and that red guy. Whoa, wait. Who's the new guy? He looks so cool. Sega sure is going all out this time. I can already tell they're gonna do great things with this character. I am not weak. <sighs> there were little things in Force's story that interested me. The Phantom Ruby being one of them. Why was it not used to a greater extent exactly? This game was an anniversary title, so they really could have gone crazy with it. The Ruby was the perfect fan service tool because Sonic Team could have brought back any character, location, etc., and wouldn't have needed to come up with an explanation because, in essence, all they would have had to do was say, because Phantom Ruby. And another overall weakness in the game's overall structure was, I'm sure you could see this coming, Infinite. After the game came out, I discovered my interest in him was rather finite. The leader of a pack of mercenaries that turns to dreams of world annihilation after he loses a game of tag to Shadow the Hedgehog. Why? Why was this game's story such a huge missed opportunity? Oh! Maybe that's because the same people who wrote Lost World wrote this. Surprise, surprise. I had so many ideas for how this game was gonna play out. So many hopes. I think that's the worst thing you can do when it comes to unresting anticipation, though, because in the end, you'll always be disappointed. Though, isn't it still fun to think about what could have been? I lay awake every night thinking about the millions of things I could have done differently to improve my quality of life. But then again, why don't we stop thinking about things that don't matter and start talking about Sonic the Hedgehog, okay? Quick note, this rewrite covers Infinite, the story as a whole, and some gameplay changes, just like the Lost World video. I figured since I was already looking at the story, I'd also shove in some other things I've been thinking about in regards to how we could make Forces a bit more entertaining. Before we get into the actual story, I wanted to discuss the changes to Infinite's character, as there are a few things that have changed. First off, he's no longer leader of the Jackal Squad, because let's be honest, they didn't really do anything to begin with. Secondly, and perhaps most importantly, Infinite does not join Eggman willingly in this rewrite. For the purpose of this video, I'm borrowing a concept from the Sega Scourge, with his permission, of course. The Sega Scourge came up with this great theory, judging by things like the lyrics to Infinite's theme and various cutscene snippets that were shown before the game released, that Infinite was being possessed by the Phantom Ruby that was implanted in his chest. Think about it. Cause I was born in this pain, it only hurts if you let it. Only scars remain of who I was. The pain persists, I can't resist. Do those lyrics not sound like someone who's totally under someone else's control? If certain other lyrics in the song alluded to the Phantom Ruby's virtual reality abilities, then why didn't these other lines mean anything substantial? We're not gonna treat the Phantom Ruby itself as possessing infinite, but we are going to change things up slightly so that Eggman brainwashed the Jackal for the purpose of controlling the Ruby. The Sega Scourge also theorized that the custom character in Infinite could have shared some sort of bond, and that, aside from forming a more interesting dynamic between the two, also gives the custom character more stakes when it comes to joining the Resistance. For the purpose of this rewrite, the custom character in Infinite are best friends, or were best friends. Think of them sort of as having like a Sonic and Tails type relationship, where Infinite is the Sonic and the custom hero is Tails. Being separated is something neither of them would ever want, but Infinite can't remember anything about his life from before he woke up with the mask on his face. So that just leaves the custom hero alone in the world, wondering what happened to their friend, and what they can do about it now that they're on their own. When it comes to personality though, I think if Infinite had a better backstory in general, it would have been more acceptable the way it was. I love how most of his dialogue just radiates that evil cheese, but with his old backstory in mind, it just kinda went from being enjoyably cheesy to really, really dumb. We all knew he was just a pathetic little runt that threw a temper tantrum, so it almost feels like one big joke. Unlike with the Deadly Six where I changed certain things about their personalities and made some of their traits more or less apparent, when it comes to rewritten Infinite though, I think of him being as an amnesiac living weapon, so basically changing his backstory accommodates for leaving his edgy personality alone. Over the course of the story, we get a sense of the bond between the custom character and Infinite, so it pretty much hammers in the fact that the new Infinite is nowhere near anything what the old Infinite was like. So basically, he's not just overly edgy for the sake of being overly edgy, it's more for like the comparison. He's not really like an edgy character, he's more a tragic one now. So with that out of the way, let's move on to the main story itself. The intro cutscene plays out the same as normal, with Eggman ranting about how this time he's totally gonna beat Sonic. We get a shot of Infinite's life sign ratings and him in his tube before it cuts away to Sonic running through Lost Valley for the first level. When Sonic arrives in the nick of time to save Tails and the extras, this is where we get our first glimpse of the baddie team. Shadow, Chaos, Metal Sonic, and Zavix stand front and center with Eggman, and this is something that is totally unexpected to everybody. I think it'd be a good idea to tone down the super obvious Phantom Ruby effects that cover their bodies in this scene, and then maybe just go like with some subtler signs of them being fakes, like much smaller, easier to miss distortions, and their eyes of course. 
In Metal Sonic and Chaos's cases, it would be even harder to see because they have special eyes. Infinite then touches down and laughs at Sonic's bewildered expression. Sonic flashes one of his trademark grins before attempting to dash at Infinite, but he's met with the usual this guy is faster than Sonic deal. The baddies beat up Sonic and take his lunch money as Tails watches helplessly. We see things go dark through Sonic's eyes as we did in the original, with Sonic hearing Tails call out his name and some laughter from Eggman as he blacks out. Now, when the story would usually just put text on screen, say, time passed, things aren't great, instead the scene comes back from a different perspective and Eggman commands Zavik to grab the hedgehog. Zavik hoists Sonic over his shoulder and he laughs, and he comments on how the revenge will be twice as painful as the damage that he caused them in the past. Infinite turns to Tails, who looks like he wants to do something, but can't move due to fear. He grunts and raises an arm to the fox as the Phantom Ruby noise rings out. Tails drops to the floor unconscious. My hero. Various townsfolk scatter since both the heroes went down, and then Infinite asks Eggman if they should take this one too, gesturing to Tails. But Eggman dismisses the thought, not wanting Sonic and Tails to be together in confinement because he knows it would bring them some sort of hope. Besides, what's the kid gonna do all on his own? He'll be lost. Infinite looks down at Tails for a little bit before Eggman asks him if there's a problem. Infinite turns back to the group and says nothing. The group exits and the scene fades to black. Next we get scenes of Eggman's troops overrunning familiar locations. Some familiar faces are also shown trying to save the natives in these areas, but they're always bested by Eggman's team. No one can quite match Infinite's power, and with the other four tagging along as well, little time passes before Eggman seizes control of the world. I'd add a small animation towards the end of the scene where Eggman and Infinite are standing over what looks to be the world map with the other baddies by their sides. And with a nice ominous laughter going on in the background, I think the world should change from the nice blue it is originally to the red signifying Eggman's complete control over it. The Resistance is looking pretty shabby at this point. They've been fighting the good fight for a while, but like Vector says, morale is dwindling. Amy expresses her hopes of Sonic still being alive, but even though Silver is an optimist, he's also a realist. He doesn't believe Sonic is coming back, and he expresses his concern for Tails, who they haven't seen hide nor hair of for quite some time. He laments the fact that Tails could have helped them greatly against Eggman's forces, but he must have felt even more defeated than he looked as he vanished a few days after he delivered the bad news about Sonic. Amy too feels concerned about Tails' safety, but they look up and Vector asks them about the new recruit. Amy says she almost forgot, shaking off her previous concerns. She pulls up the rookie's file as you're thrust into the character creation screen. After you're done with that, Knuckles barges into the room, announcing the arrival of the new recruit. The custom hero timidly walks into the room, looking around at all the smiling faces of the main cast. Vector and Charmy don't think they look very useful, but Knuckles shuts them down. Quick note, even though the dialogue that takes place on the map screen was probably a huge budget saver, we're gonna move anything that's important to actual cutscenes. We don't really have to worry about budget here, thankfully. A transmission would come across the big screen and Rouge would pop up. She'd tell the gang that she has solid intel that points to Sonic being alive. Amy would of course be ecstatic about this, and she'd turn to Silver who would say something like, Of course! This is Sonic we're talking about! I didn't doubt him for a second! Amy would then give Silver a skeptical look based on his comments from moments before, but then just give him a big ol' smile. The gang learns that he's being kept on the Death Egg, so the Custom Hero's first mission in Spaceport begins. Meanwhile, Tails is flying through the city, far above any danger that might be present below, when he spots Omega just kinda lying around. He looks from side to side, nervously scanning the area before he drops down. Omega is in a state of disrepair, and Tails, being the scientist he is, can't bear to leave him like this. He pulls out the tools he was carrying with him, and he gets to work. Some indication of time passing would occur, and Tails would apologize to Omega as he can't figure out how to reactivate him. But what's this? The nearby manhole gets pushed out of the way, and our boy Chaos seeps onto the battlefield. Tails hears all the sloshing and turns around to see Chaos Zero walking towards him, menacingly. Tails looks side to side and closes his eyes, but he also sticks out his arms in front of Omega. He doesn't know what to do, but he can't just abandon him, especially in the state he's in. Suddenly, a convenient Phantom Ruby portal appears, but not in the place you'd suspect. Above Chaos, Classic Sonic falls from the sky, but thinking quick, he engages his spin ball, knocking Chaos away from Tails as he reaches out to grab him. Classic looks a little disgruntled, but he turns to Tails and gives him a thumbs up as Tails opens his eyes. Tails sees the familiar iconic shoes first, and he looks up with glee in his eyes. That glee is slightly diminished, though, when he realizes it's not his Sonic. He questions why the Sonic from the past is suddenly in their time, but he doesn't have too long to muse before Chaos reforms behind Classic. Look, we all know Chaos doesn't go down in one hit. It takes at least three. Classic motions for Tails to get back as he charges forwards towards the watery beast. Hallelujah! It's time for a Chaos boss fight! Now, we just had perfect Chaos for generations, so I say we go with what we're given here. Today, we're getting a Chaos Zero boss fight for Classic Sonic. In this theoretical boss fight, I could imagine a nice remix of the Chaos Zero 2-4 theme from Sonic Adventure, but that's not all we're taking from the source material. 
In this fight, Classic Sonic would obviously be confined to 2D movement, but Chaos would fight you from both the foreground and background. When he's in the foreground, he'd do some kind of spin attacks with his arms flailing at you, and once he's done, he'd become vulnerable for a moment. Once Chaos is struck by Classic Sonic, he'd leap into the background of the nearby rooftops, and he'd target Classic. He'd then shoot his arms down at Classic, kind of like he did to Modern Sonic in their first encounter, and after his attacks are avoided, he'd jump back to the foreground and land with a small shockwave wherever Classic Sonic was previously standing. Since this is now the first boss in the game, it wouldn't be too challenging, but it'd just be a nice little throwback and something for the adventure fans so we don't feel quite as robbed. Cause, you know, we got robbed. Chaos slinks away back down the manhole, and Tails congratulates Sonic on his win. Tails then tries to piece together why Classic might be there, and the only thing he can think of is that it has something to do with Eggman and the new mysterious force that beats Sonic. Classic looks shocked, and Tails' eyes meet the floor when he realizes what he just said. Tails sees Classic's hand wave out of the corner of his eye, and he looks up to see Classic pointing to himself and then throwing out a thumbs up. Tails smiles and says he doesn't really matter why Classic Sonic was brought there, all that matters is that they've got more of a chance to avenge Sonic and save the world. Classic Sonic reaches out for a fist bump, and Tails meets him halfway. Now, I decided not to remove Classic Sonic from the rewrite because I felt like that'd be too drastic of a change. Like, with the Lost World video, I kind of wanted to take what we already had in Forces and try to do something more fun. So, of course, that being said, in this hypothetical scenario, Classic Sonic wouldn't nearly be as awful to play as as he was in the original. Think of how Mania controlled, except with the graphics of Forces. Nice thought, right? After the main cast blasts off to the Death Egg, the custom hero makes their way through Prison Hall. Upon reaching the end of the road, they are surrounded by enemies, and they quickly lose composure and they cower. They firmly shut their eyes, and when they open them again, they're reliving a memory from a few months prior. Infinite is wiping the floor with some resistance members, and as they're all blasted away, a lone Wispawn falls beside them. The custom hero fumbles to pick up the Wispawn, now getting a better look at Infinite. They notice specifically his hair and tail, and something about that seems to bother the character. The Wispawn is in their hands, but they're shaking like a leaf as they point it at him. Infinite reads the custom character as typical lines about being able to taste their terror and being able to feel their anxiety and doubt. Infinite then pauses for a moment while looking down at the custom hero. He doesn't know why he stopped, or why he said what he did, but it's almost as if he knew exactly how they're feeling. Infinite gives them the option to flee, but only if they acknowledge their fear and incompetence. He laughs as the custom hero holds his gaze for a moment, before shutting their eyes and running in the opposite direction, Infinite's laughter echoing from behind. We then transition to Sonic's cell, where he's looking a little down. Being in prison for six months will do that to you. Zavik would waltz on in and throw some shade at Sonic for letting himself get defeated so easily, especially after he put up such a good fight last time they met. Sonic, not totally broken yet, would mention something about it not exactly being a fair fight, considering it was five on one. He'd then harp on Zavik for needing to rely on four other people just to beat one little hedgehog. Zavik slams his fists against the wall nearby, and Sonic stops chuckling. Just then, the alarm goes off, and Sonic's cell and energy cuffs power down. Sonic hops off the bench in disbelief, but then his old cocky smile returns to his face. Sonic cracks his knuckles and starts stretching. Zavik asks Sonic where he thinks he's going, to which Sonic replies, I was thinking of taking a little walk. Care to join me? He dashes past Zavik, and Zavik lets out a guttural roar as he follows close behind. The boss fight proceeds as normal, except now when Sonic beats the ever-loving hell out of Zavik at the end, it might feel a little bit more like he's letting out some repressed anger for the bad treatment over the last six months. Sonic turns away from Zavik as he falls to the ground defeated, and he turns around again when he notices that weird sound. He doesn't see Zavik fade away, but he figures that the Brute had enough energy left to retreat. Sonic takes a nice space run through Egg Gate, and then when he reaches the end, this is where he encounters the Custom Hero for the first time. Sonic blasts through all the robots surrounding the Custom Hero and helps them up. The two get a radio call from Knuckles and Amy, and then they board the shuttle back to Earth, leaving the Death Egg behind them. When they return, Sonic and the Custom Hero go on their first mission as a duo. The gang then gets a report from Silver saying that Infinite is attacking Mystic Forest, so Sonic heads off again. Silver and Infinite duke it out like normal. Look at my boy doing his best! Perfect! And then Sonic takes up his defensive stance in front of Silver, and the rest of this plays out like normal. And since we can't seem to get enough Green Hill, let's have Green Hill again. Classic Sonic was literally just here. Tails and Classic head off to Green Hill because Tails notices some Eggman-y vibes emanating from that direction. Now that he's armed with a Sonic, Tails thinks they might be able to end the war, I guess. Tails and Classic sit behind a rock and overhear Infant and Eggman talking about the breakout on the Death Egg. They don't specifically mention Sonic by name, though. Tails is hopeful, of course, but he doesn't say anything. They also mention the Phantom Ruby prototypes, which Tails takes note of, before Infinite pieces out leaving Eggman behind. Tails and Classic emerge from their hiding place, and when Eggman sees Classic Sonic, he just groans. He insists that he's a very busy man and he doesn't have time to play with the likes of them, but Classic Sonic jumps in with a spin attack. Eggman reconsiders his previous words and decides that now would be a great time to deal with the pair of puny pests after all. Commence pathetic Egg Dragoon fight. 
In order to make this more involved than just drop dashing back and forth, I would love for there to be some extra sections in this fight where like the Egg Dragoon is in the foreground with you and maybe you need to like roll under its like little arm attacks or maybe it throws more projectiles at you or missiles and they're harder to dodge because it's right there instead of in the background. And then I guess you can still hit it the same way, but I just feel like there should be more substance in between the moments where you can just spam damage on it. Eggman reiterates this defeat means nothing as their final curtain call is approaching fast. He takes off and we transition back to the custom hero who takes a leisurely stroll through Park Avenue. Switching back to Tails and Classic again, Tails gets more readings about a potential Eggman lab in Mystical Forest. So they head off that away to try and figure out some secrets about the Phantom Ruby. They enter the base and Tails starts snooping around, but unfortunately all the data pertaining to the Phantom Ruby has been wiped. Tails curses Eggman for thinking ahead for once and the scene fades out. The custom hero is then sent through Aqua Road to investigate the signs of life near the lab, however once they get there, there is not a fox or hog to be found. The custom hero is about to cut their losses and head back when they notice something shiny. Oh boy, it's one of those Phantom Ruby prototypes, better hang out of that. They're about to head off again, but they notice the sound of some kind of radio interference, almost like their resistance radio is picking up another frequency. The custom hero wanders a bit until they find, in a bush, another communicator that's covered in dust. The custom hero recognizes this device and pulls out a similar one from their bag, or hammer space, whatever you want to go with. The custom hero grits their teeth, clutching the device in their hand before turning around and heading back. And now it's time to get Shadow in on the rewrite action. Sonic is alerted to Shadow's whereabouts, so he takes off for Sunset Heights. After reaching the broody boy at the goal emblem, the real fun begins. Sonic asks Shadow why he's allied himself with the enemy, to which Shadow doesn't respond. Sonic, frustrated, charges towards Shadow, and as he gets within attacking range, a flash of white floods the screen, blinding him. Oh, and the Phantom Ruby sound effect plays as well. When Sonic regains his sight, the two hedgehogs are on a familiar platform somewhere deep in the jungle. Sonic looks over at Shadow, who has taken up a defensive stance, and he laughs. I didn't think you were the sentimental type, Shadow. If this is what it's gonna take to get you to talk, then bring it on, faker! See, we got a Shadow boss fight too, isn't that fun? Since we had a fight that involved high-speed antics back in Generations, this time we're having a more slow-paced fight, sort of like the Zavik encounter from earlier. Taking cues from the original boss fight, the goal is to homing attack Shadow when he's vulnerable, but this time he's not just gonna walk around and wait to be hit. The instant you get too close to him, he'll activate Chaos Control, which freezes you in place for a moment while he skates away to prepare an attack. If you can manage to rush over to him as he's charging, he can land a free hit on him before he unleashes the attack, Otherwise, you're gonna need to dodge the barrage and follow it up with a homing attack while he's distracted. I can imagine after a few hits he'd start rapidly teleporting across the stage, unleashing a lot more attacks and a lot quicker, but as soon as the pattern ends, it'd be your chance to attack again. Upon dealing the final blow, the two are sent back to Sunset Heights, where Shadow uses Chaos Control to slow time and teleport behind Sonic, where he prepares to deliver a swift roundhouse kick to the back of his head. But this is where the real Shadow enters the fray and ends the duplicate's existence with a swift roundhouse kick of his own. Sonic sees the fake fly past his head and turns to see the real Shadow, who explains to him that the other was a fake. Sonic doesn't understand how that's possible, but Shadow asks if anything seemed weird about the fight they just had. Sonic tells Shadow that all of a sudden they were on Prison Island, and Shadow just grunts. So you have trouble believing that duplicates exist, but you have no issues fighting on an island that exploded years ago? <laughs> oh yeah, I guess that kind of slipped my mind. Hey, didn't the moon explode too? Did we ever do anything about that? Shadow sighs and motions for Sonic to follow him back to the Resistance base. Right before Shadow came to Sonic's rescue, he was dealing with some problems of his own back in Episode Shadow. We flash back to the time before Sonic was defeated, and Shadow and Rouge are talking about how suspicious Eggman has been lately. Shadow is then dispatched into enemy territory, following Omega, who went on ahead. Throughout the stage, the two catch Omega's confusion over the radio, and neither know what's happening to him. The pair doesn't find Omega anywhere, but what they do find is a mysterious masked figure that looks down on Shadow from the air. Infinite slowly descends and walks towards Shadow. The world around them seems to distort as he draws nearer. Shadow is slightly intimidated by this, but he stands his ground. Nice light show. Any chance you could cut the theatrics and tell me if you're the reason for all the trouble around here? Infinite laughs at this as he raises his palm to Shadow. Infinite tells Shadow that he looks like the perfect test subject for his new power. Infinite then spawns some cannons to attack Shadow, but he dodges out of the way and is able to get a better look at his masked assailant. Shadow ponders why his voice sounds so familiar, and that in conjunction with his hair and tail, Shadow recalls something that happened months prior. Yep, there's a flashback in the flashback, just like the original. Episode Shadow, everybody. Shadow's bumming around Eggman's facility because he's part of Team Dark and they feel the need to keep tabs on Eggman at all times. Once he hits the end of the road, a figure is blocking his entrance to Eggman's lab. Shadow hears the figure say, Oh, it looks like I've got company. I'll get back to you soon, I promise. Before lowering a radio device to his waist. The figure turns around. It's a jackal with long white hair, and one of his hands is hovering over a sword sheath at his waist. 
The Jackal tells Shadow that he's not looking for a fight, but he's not afraid to get his hands dirty. Shadow grunts and begins approaching the Jackal, who then takes the sword out from his sheath and points it in Shadow's direction. Shadow shakes his head and vanishes from sight, quickly reappearing behind him. It doesn't matter what the Doctor is planning. I won't let it happen. The Jackal whips around, confused. Wait, you're not working with- But before he can finish that sentence, Shadow commences the beatdown. The Jackal gets thrown aside, his radio disconnecting from his belt and sliding into the bushes. Shadow pushes the down creature aside, joking about how Eggman's forces just keep getting weaker and weaker. Shadow exits the scene, leaving the injured Jackal laying there, barely conscious. The Jackal fades in and out multiple times, time passing with each blackout, but upon returning for a few moments, he notices someone standing in front of him. He can't quite crane his neck to see who it is, but he hears their voice. Oh, it must be my lucky day! I hardly had to leave my front porch to find a suitable candidate for the Phantom Ruby. Orbot, Cubot, prep this creature for... But that's all he hears as he fades out again. We then fade back to Shadow and Infinite in the city. You're that jackal from before. The one from Mystic Forest. Infinite hasn't the slightest idea what Shadow's talking about, and he continues firing on him. He didn't have this power the last time we met. And that mask and jewel in his chest. Is this the Doctor's doing? Is this all because of my metal? Shadow is knocked aside suddenly by Infinite's attacks. Shadow looks up at Infinite from the ground as the Jackal cackles. A deafening sound causes Shadow to wince, and then things go black. Infinite's laughter sticks with Shadow as he fades out. Shadow wakes up in Green Hill with Rouge on the radio. Shadow doesn't remember traveling here, but Rouge says he's supposed to be looking for Omega. He asks about Infinite, but Rouge just tells him to get moving. Throughout the stage, some of the unused voice clips would pop up. I really enjoyed how rude they made the fake Rouge. I, I think it really messed the Shadow's head a bit more, and that's the goal here, because also throughout the stage, you're gonna be hearing some weird sounds in the background. So Shadow starts hearing these cries in the distance, or more specifically, roars mixed with cries. He thinks he hears a soft voice calling his name, one that he remembers all too well. He shakes it off because he knows that's impossible, and as he reaches the end of the stage, the cries fade away and the roars are deafening. The level ends and Shadow happens upon the Bio Lizard, just standing out in the middle of Green Hill Zone. Well, that doesn't seem right. I figured since we'd here, we'd throw a boss into Episode Shadow because I like having fun and Forces needs more fun things. The fight would play out sort of like its Sonic Generations counterpart, except this time in HD. Shadow has to quickly dodge tail swipes from the Bio Lizard, and every so often it'll go into a frenzy and require either boosting or well-timed slides to dodge an even faster tail whip. It would leave itself open to attacks after each pattern like usual, but it would start messing with gravity much sooner in an effort to slow Shadow down. When affected by low gravity, Shadow would need to float side to side to avoid energy blasts from the Bio Lizard's mouth, and then when it gets all tuckered out, that's when he's able to float towards the core and attack it. Upon reaching the final segment on its health bar, the Bio Lizard flings Shadow away at great distance, but the game takes over as Shadow air boosts back at the Bio Lizard, dashing straight through the core on its back, causing it to shriek and collapse. The Bio Lizard doesn't move once it's down. Shadow examines it closely, but he notices that it is slightly see-through at this point. The Bio Lizard fades out of existence in front of him before a blinding light and loud noise cause him to cover his eyes. Shadow is back in the city with Infinite again, even more exhausted than when he blacked out. Was that... a dream? Infinite shakes his head at Shadow and explains that the Phantom Ruby gives him the ability to throw others into virtual reality-esque delusions. But the best thing about the Phantom Ruby is that when you're under its power, even though everything you're seeing might be an illusion, it's still just as real to you as if it were real. Infinite floats back up into the sky, laughing about how not even Sonic can stop him now. Infinite teleports away and Shadow clambers to his feet. He radios for Rouge and tells him that he doesn't like what's going on here and he needs help to put a stop to it, for the sake of that Jackal and the world. Shadow rejoins the main story after the fake Shadow fight, where he explains to Sonic and the rest of the Resistance members about how the Phantom Ruby works. He mentions his rematch with Bio Lizard, and Sonic mentions Prison Island, along with all the previous foes they've faced that couldn't possibly be here. Shadow tells the gang that if they can somehow destroy the Phantom Ruby, it would severely cripple Eggman's forces. The only question is how. Sonic thinks Tails might be able to come up with something, but he looks around and he doesn't see him. Come to think of it, where is Tails? I thought he'd be the first one here to greet me off that shuttle. The gang fills Sonic in on the Tails situation. Sonic looks distraught that he caused his little buddy so much pain in his absence, but he breaks himself out of it and says they need to get on tracking him down. Knuckles proposes Operation Big Wave here, so the Custom Hero gears up for battle while Sonic stays behind to heal and assist in the Tails locating. The Custom Hero comes face to face with Infinite in this stage. After the first ramp, Infinite hones in on the Custom Hero and is relentless to them the entire stage until they finally meet at the end. Infinite is waiting as the Custom Hero runs up to meet him. Infinite catches the Custom Hero off guard, but they don't back down. The time they've had with Sonic so far has taught them a little bit about confidence. 
The custom hero reaches one hand out, fist clenched to infinite, and infinite takes this as a challenge. Before the battle begins, though, the custom hero flips their hand around and opens it, revealing the communicator they found in Mystic Jungle. Infinite stops and his eyes dart to the object in their hand. He looks up at the custom hero, who is staring intently at him. Infinite looks down at the device again. He takes it from them curiously and holds it up to the light, seemingly taking in every angle of the thing, before he crushes it abruptly, much to the custom hero's dismay. Infinite asks if the custom hero thought that offering him worthless trinkets would save them. He laughs and says that they're even more of a lost cause than he thought. After the fight, Infinite admits that he's pretty impressed with their abilities, and that he actually remembers the custom hero now. The custom hero of course misinterprets this, but then their hopes are dashed when Infinite recalls the last time they met, and he allowed them to run away and remain alive. He prepares to blast the custom hero, but thanks to the Phantom Ruby prototype, the custom hero escapes without a scratch. Infinite can't believe his eyes, but he decides that it's no trouble as the Resistance has less than two days before total annihilation anyway. He speeds off, leaving the custom hero by themselves yet again. Meanwhile, Tails and Classic Sonic are headed towards the chemical plant to try and find out what that Phantom Ruby thing is, and more importantly, how to stop it. At the same time, however, the Resistance and Modern Sonic are tracking their signals, assuming that it's Tails. Sonic hasn't quite healed up enough yet to go after Tails himself, so they settle for attempting to try and broadcast a message to the chemical plant's computer system to alert Tails of their plans. Tails and Classic reach the computer room and they discover information about how the Ruby works, how it needs a power source to function, and they also learn that the Ruby was implanted in a jackal that Eggman discovered outside his base. And the jackal seemingly recalls nothing from before the installation of the Ruby. The notes they find call him the perfect brainwashed minion. Tails shudders at this, not understanding how anybody, even Eggman, could be that cruel. Tails almost forgets all of this, though, when they come across the transmission from the Resistance. Sonic is alive. Classic turns to Tails, smiling, and he does his little Generations end of level S-rank animation, the little, like, dance thing. He's super happy about the situation, but probably not as happy as Tails, because he grabs Classic by the hand with a huge smile on his face, and they make a mad dash back for the Resistance base. Now we get the reunion scene between Sonic and Tails. Classic Sonic rushes up to meet Modern Sonic as well, and he gives him a high five after the It's Been Generations line. It's mandatory that we keep that one in there because I really like it. The custom hero is also returned by this point, and they're introduced to Tails and Classic. And Classic, being the friendly little guy he is, hands out more fist bumps, which the custom hero gladly returns. Seeing Sonic and Tails reunited puts the custom hero in a better mood after their battle with Infinite. But that mood soon sours when Tails begins recounting what they learned from the Chemical Plant database. The custom hero finally lets it slip that one of the reasons they joined the Resistance was because their friend went missing and they had a hunch Dr. Eggman had something to do with it. The entire Resistance solemnly avert their eyes as the custom hero talks about how Infinite is not even close to the person that he used to be. Sonic steps in and puts a hand on the custom hero's shoulder, and he promises that they'll find a way to get him back. More impossible things have happened, and now that we're all together, nothing could possibly stand in our way. The custom hero nods their head as the rest of the gang rallies around Sonic. Metal Sonic makes himself known, so Modern Sonic and the Custom Hero go off to stop him. After that, the Custom Hero heads over to Guardian Rock to distract Eggman's forces as Tails and Classic Sonic hightail it to the Death Egg to destroy the Phantom Ruby's power source. Tails and Classic Sonic infiltrate the Death Egg and they wreak havoc on the thing until they get to the end of the stage, where Infinite is lying in wait. Classic Sonic rushes out to start the Death Egg's self-destruct sequence, but Infinite catches him by surprise and suspends him in the air while he gloats. Tails starts to freak out about the idea of losing Classic to Infinite, but he remembers back to when Classic first appeared. Classic risked his life to save him from chaos, and he'd been helping him through the pain of losing his Sonic the entire time. Not once did Classic ever complain about being along for the ride. In fact, he looked overjoyed to be able to help Tails in his time of need. Tails clenches his fists and rushes out from his hiding place, activating the self-destruct sequence, and before Infinite can process what's happening, he leaps up and delivers a tail swipe to his back, causing him to drop Classic. Classic sticks the landing, of course, and thrusts his fist into the air excitedly in Tails' direction. The two of them rush off while Infinite tries to stop the Death Egg from exploding, but he's left with no choice other than to abandon ship as the station meets its end yet again. Everyone at the Resistance is overjoyed that they've dealt this blow to Eggman, but Eggman still has some tricks up his sleeve. Sonic heads off for Metropolitan Highway to find Eggman, but he's in for a big surprise. Along with the custom hero Tails and Classic Sonic, Sonic confronts Eggman, who then activates the Null Space Portal. All four of them are sucked into Null Space, leaving the rest of the Resistance members totally on their own. Eggman delivers the exposition about Null Space to Knuckles, who arrives shortly after, and then the scene fades out. The four heroes awake in a dark realm where there's nothing as far as the eye can see. Classic Sonic and the custom hero silently look around while Tails gets to work thinking about how they can escape an inescapable void. Sonic turns to the group and says that he's gonna do what he always does when things look bad. He reaches his hand out towards the custom hero. The custom hero nods and takes Sonic's hand. 
Sonic motions for Classic and Tails to follow him and the four head off. No Space is actually a full level this time, too. Even though I really liked the original level, I was always kind of bummed they didn't use Null Space to its full potential. So instead of leaving Null Space immediately, we don't leave Null Space until the very end of the level. Modern Sonic and the Custom Hero do their double boost to break free, and a portal opens back in the real world. They'd conveniently exit Null Space right where the original level would have ended, so they're right next to Eggman. Eggman and Infant are taken aback that they escaped Null Space so easily, and Sonic says something about friendship, because of course he does. Eggman speeds off angrily, and Sonic, Tails, Classic, and the Custom Hero celebrate their small victory. Now it's time for the big climactic battle between Team Sonic and Team Eggman. All of Sonic's friends and all the nameless, less important randos charge into battle, fighting off hordes of Shadow, Chaos, Infinite, Zavok, and Metal Sonic. They look like they might be getting the upper hand, but unfortunately the army was just for show. Sonic reaches Infinite, who applauds them on their efforts. Infinite notes that they seem to be one short, seeing as how the custom hero isn't among their ranks. Did they finally run home with their tail between their legs? Sonic yells at Infinite to stop talking about their friend like that. They're your friend too, you know. They've been trying to get through to you this whole time, and they haven't backed down even once, even in the scariest situations. Infinite pauses and rests a hand on his mask, while Eggman barks out orders for him to do it already in the background. A friend? Me? Don't make me laugh. Infinite shoots into the sky, and the sun appears overhead. The custom hero and Tails discuss the situation, and they come to the realization that the only thing that can neutralize the effects of the Phantom Ruby are the Phantom Ruby prototype that the custom character has. The custom hero climbs up Imperial Tower, and in the nick of time is able to tether to something within the sun. As they zip towards the ball of fire, they fly towards Infinite, who places himself in the way, attempting to stop whatever they're doing. The custom hero shifts to the side slightly, zipping past Infinite, but locking eyes with him just for a moment. Time seems to slow down as the two look at each other. Infinite's eye darts to the sun, and then back to them. It widens, but the custom hero zips away and the sun vanishes, just as it's about to fall upon Sonic and his friends below. The Resistance celebrates the turning point of the war, and not dying, of course, and Eggman, meanwhile, grows angrier. And that's understandable, I mean, he's been bragging about this three-day plan for a while now. Sonic then takes on Mortar Canyon, and happens upon Infinite at the end. He mocks Sonic for thinking that their problems are over, and prattles on like usual. The battle begins with Sonic leaping into action after Infinite. The battle is similar to the original, up until the point where the Custom Hero zips in to help out. Sonic and the Custom Hero stand against Infinite, and Infinite shakes his head and growls. It matters not how many of you there are. You will all submit to the Phantom Ruby's power! He activates the ruby, lifting his adversaries off their feet, and after a flash of white, they find themselves in a twisted realm, something between Null Space and Mortar Canyon. Red block strands litter the platform, providing even more things to dodge as the duo approaches Infinite at high speeds. Every so often, Infinite stops in a large round arena along the pathway and unleashes a new barrage of attacks and enemies, but it leaves him vulnerable to attack. This repeats, getting progressively harder, with new attacks thrown in, until finally Infinite charges up a massive ball of energy, intending to end the fight. Sonic and the Custom Hero charge up their double boost, barrel right through the energy blast, and slam into Infinite. He hits the ground with a thud, and the landscape returns to that of the regular Mortar Canyon. Infinite struggles to pick himself up, ranting under his breath about how it's impossible that they could be this strong. Sonic delivers another cheesy line about real power coming from friendship, and that's when the Custom Hero steps forward and tries to help Infinite up. The Custom Hero helps Infinite to his feet, and he clutches his side as his body starts to fade slightly. He pushes off the Custom Hero and tries to steady himself, but collapses again. The Custom Hero tries to help him again, but their hand is slapped away. There's a long pause before Infinite clutches his mask and writhes in pain. He lifts into the air and shoots away into the distance. The Custom Hero outstretches a hand after him and then looks down. Sonic puts a hand on their shoulder and says, I know you're worried about him. I am too. That's all the reason to finally take the fight to Eggman. For your friend and the world, let's end this! Classic Sonic then takes out Iron Fortress, and the Custom Hero and Sonic destroy the reactor in Final Judgment. The finale is now upon us. Sonic and the others are patting themselves on the back, saying that everything is wrapped up now, but Rouge radios in, telling them the exact opposite. Sonic, Classic, Tails, and the Custom Hero don't have time to think about that, though, since Eggman rises from behind them in his newly souped-up Death Egg robot, now called the Egg Naga. It always bothered me that they called this thing a Death Egg Robot, because, I, I mean, look at it. That might be what it used to be, but I mean, it isn't anymore. Plus, it has this cool snake tail thing, so I feel like Egg Naga fits it pretty well. The fight is exactly the same up until the Custom Hero depletes the Egg Naga's second health bar. The bot stands there motionless for a moment, and some small pulsations can be heard. It's really muffled, but at this point it's possible to hear Eggman yelling about something from inside the cockpit. The boss's chest begins physically jerking around as the glass shatters and that weird white squid contraption flies out, roaring and causing phantom ruby distortions. The rest of the boss falls away behind it, and Eggman yells about how he can't believe this as the battle transitions. 
Tails gets on the radio and informs the trio that the Phantom Ruby is seemingly now going haywire as the overclocking has stressed it to the point where it doesn't need a user to control it. The trio dashes forward to combat the out-of-control Ruby and manages to subdue it after a mighty triple boost. The Squidbot lands with a thud next to the trio. Back on the battlefield, Knuckles and the others jump for joy as Eggman's clone army vanishes. Once they all regroup, they notice that the Phantom Ruby is hovering above the trashed Squidbot. It makes its trademark noise and a portal opens. Classic Sonic looks at the portal and then the rest of the gang and points a thumb up at his chest and then at the portal. Tails and Classic have their little fist bump bro moment, Modern Sonic gives him a high five, and he throws the custom hero and the rest of the gang a thumbs up and a smile before he leaps into the portal, with the Phantom Ruby entering shortly after him. In this rewrite, the next canon thing to happen to Classic Sonic is Sonic Mania Plus, even though the original Forces ending kinda connected more with Mania Adventures. Sonic rallies the entire gang, talking about how they need to fix up their world, and the credits roll. Afterwards, Knuckles walks into the Resistance base and proclaims that there's no more need for a Resistance. The rest of the gang agrees, and with perfect timing, Omega is reactivated and he immediately stands up, cannons bared, demanding to know when the next battle is. A lot of them laugh as Omega looks around confused. Rouge welcomes him back, and Tails pats him on the arm. Sorry it took so long, buddy. Omega puts away his cannons, and he almost looks disappointed at the implications before him. The custom hero quietly slinks out through the exit, though, and no one seems to notice aside from Sonic. The custom hero is outside, looking down at their old communicator. Sonic approaches from behind, which startles them. Thinking of heading out, then? The custom hero nods their head and shows Sonic their communicator. I know, I know. You have to go find him. Well, if anyone could bring him back to his senses, it's you. Good luck, partner. Sonic reaches out for a fist bump, which the custom hero happily returns. The custom hero runs toward the railing and jumps off, zipping away into the sunset, more determined than ever to find and help their friend. Sonic stays outside and watches them go, and then heads back into the resistance base as the final scene fades out. And finally... That's it. That took a lot longer than I thought it would. So yeah, this is how I would have handled Force's story if I was in charge, and I know this isn't going to be everybody's cup of tea, but there are just so many of you that asked me to try a video on this topic that I wasn't about to ignore you. Plus, I love telling stories. Like, just getting all these ideas down in this video was so much fun for me. Like, after the last one, I was probably already going to do this, but I was so happy that you all liked it. So hopefully you'll find something you enjoy in this one as well. Speaking of the last one, feel free to check that out in the card right up there if you haven't seen it. And feel free to tell me what game you'd like to see me tackle next in the comments below. I do do other things aside from story rewrites, such as reviews, challenge videos, and mod showcases, so if you want to see any of those things, you can also see those in the card up there. I'd like to once again thank the Sega Scourge for letting me use some of the concept from his Forces Theory, and I'd also like to thank all of you for waiting patiently for this one while I struggled to get it out. I apologize if some parts of this video my voice sounds a little strained or unenthusiastic. I I'm still not feeling well, and it was kind of a huge struggle to record this because it's turning out to be around 40 minutes already. This will probably be the last scripted video for a little bit until after I recover, but I'm glad I was able to finally get this one out at least. But that's going to be all for today, so if you like this video and you haven't already, please make sure you subscribe, click the bell, follow my Twitter, and join the Discord to keep up with more story rewrites and other things that aren't story rewrites because I do a lot of things. I'd also like to give a huge thank you to my current sponsors who are Silva PhD, Knuckles Channel 3 and Knuckles, Atlas Requiem, Cringe Channel, Supersonic 99 of CCI Games, Nick46, Jaded Indolent, Bob the Hedgehog Gamer, Cosmic Mushroom, Lucas Tallman, Nico the Person, Mitron, Kenneth Gutierrez, Henry S, Rob Morrison, Mega Traficone Creative, and Mike TGC. Thank you guys so much for sponsoring, it really means a lot. And if you have any interest in becoming a sponsor yourself, please click that cool new join button right underneath the video. That's all you gotta do now. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you guys next time.